Brother Carl wanted me to clarify some of the announcements that he made just uh, just a few moments ago. One week from tonight, we're all going out to the Kimbrew's house, and we're going to have a hayride, and we're going to have a bonfire, and we might even blow up a cannon or something like we did before out there. We'll have a great time. It's for everybody, and bring some side dishes that'll go well with barbecue. And I really, really hope you'll take advantage of this great fellowship opportunity for yourself and for your children and all those that you love and all those that you love to be with. And then the following Sunday night, that's two Sunday nights from this one, we will have our kind of a Halloween trick-or-treat alternative. We'll be having our trunk or treat. We need at least 25 or so of us to decorate our trunks or our trucks or our vans and fill them up with candy and let's, let's make that a good opportunity for our children. We also need 20, 25 big tubs of chili and if you can help us out with that, that'd be wonderful. There are sign-up sheets back in the back for some of that. Also, you can actually go online and you can sign up at our website, Church of Christ, Tuscumbia Church of Christ.org. Tuscumbia Church of You can get more information about all these activities. I spoke to Carlos McMullins just uh, literally a few minutes ago. And Carlos and Lois, they're not able to be with us very much these days. They've been having a lot of challenges in their lives, health challenges in particular, and uh, they need our prayers. Today they are celebrating their 62nd wedding anniversary. So if you have opportunity, if you could create an opportunity to communicate with them, uh, maybe not necessarily tonight, but in the next few days, let them know that they're loved and missed, if we can minister to them in any way. We need to help them because he's having a really tough time getting out and about, and, and she is also. So those are good people, and we do not need to, to uh, neglect them in, in helping to meet some of their needs. How bad is it to be lost? Think about that for just a moment. How bad is it to be lost? In the New Testament, it is revealed to us that it is unspeakably horrible to be lost. We've been studying in Luke 15 the last several sermons together, but before we get into that, I just want you to think about what happens in Luke 16. In Luke 16, Jesus tells a story of a man who is lost. In this life, he's called a rich man. There was also a poor man, a beggar man by the name of, of Lazarus there. And you remember that both of these men died. Whenever Lazarus died, he is carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. He's in a place of paradise. He's in a place of, of joy, of celebration, of comfort. But this rich man, as we know from the telling of it from Jesus Christ our Lord, he was not in a good place. He's in a horrible place. He is able to, while in this place, the rich man is, he's able to look up and see Lazarus. He's able to see Abraham. He's able to see them together in a place of joy. And the text there says that he cried out, being in torments. And he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus, that he may dip, notice this, the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue. And then, and then listen to this. For I am tormented, I'm tormented in this flame. How bad is it to be lost? Well, the rich man would say, it's really bad. That we ought to do everything and anything we can do to avoid being lost. If it took climbing the highest mountain, we need to start climbing. If it took swimming the, the widest ocean, we better start swimming. Whatever it takes to avoid the eternal damning destiny of the rich man. Whatever we need to do to avoid that, let us be about the business of doing whatever to avoid that. Because it really is a rotten and horrible and tragic thing to be lost. It's not a temporary condition. It's not fixable. It is permanent. It is it's eternal. It's eternal. We get some idea about how bad it is to be lost, not just by the words of the rich man who is in fact lost when he cries out, 
but we get some idea about how bad it is to be lost by our examination of the parables in Luke 15. Remember in Luke 15, there is a sheep that gets lost, there's a coin that gets lost, and there's a boy that gets lost. We get something, we get at least a glimpse into how bad it is to be lost by virtue of the celebrations that occur when that which is lost is found. And when there is such joy, that ought to indicate to us that not only is it wonderful to be found, it is not so wonderful to be unfound, to be lost, to be unsaved. And, and we need to probably adjust our thinking, adjust our view of what it means and what it is to be eternally lost in a devil's hell. And that would affect our, our talk about what it means to be lost. It would affect our attitude and behavior towards those who are in fact lost. And, and it would be a great injustice to lost people everywhere, a great injustice to reality, if, if we are nonchalant about what it means and what it is to be lost or what the prospects are for those who are in fact lost. And, and we, can, we can be somewhat nonchalant, casual, routine in our thinking about it, in our speaking about it. And, and we, we might just characterize someone as being lost like, well, well, they're tall, or they're short, or they're Republican, or they're Democrat, or they're blonde, or they're blue, brunette, or, or they're whatever. And we can just say lost like we throw out any other adjective. But that's not what the scriptures portray lost as being. Lost is so terrible that Jesus came to this earth to seek and save that which was, remember the word? Lost. Lost. He, he went through Hades in a sense. He went through hell on that cross because lost is so terrible, because lost is so awful. And, and, and we've got to see it for the awfulness that it is, and that would, that would ratchet up our intensity, our efforts to make sure that we have accepted and embraced the amazing grace of God that makes our salvation from lostness possible. Plus, it also will help us to do, as we sang about just a few moments ago, seeking the lost, going afar, and you know, doing whatever we need to do to let lost people know that they are loved, that there can be relief, that, that lost in this life is not a permanent condition, but lost in the next life is a permanent condition. And now, today, thankfully, the good news is lost is fixable. We can become unlost. We can get found. We can get saved. If we will do what the thousands did in Acts chapter 2, if we will repent of our sins, if we will be immersed in water, we can have not only the remission of our sins, but the gift of the Holy Spirit, and we can be added, according to Acts 2.47, we can be added by the Lord to his church. And that must be our message. It must be resonating from us with a, a great sense of enthusiasm and passion. Tonight, if I knew that the bridge was out between Colbert County and Lauderdale County, if I knew that the bridge connecting Muscle Shoals or Sheffield or Tuscumbia over into the folks of Florence, if I knew that that bridge was out and I knew that all of you folks were tonight going to take a little field trip over to Florence, I would be doing everything within my power to warn you, don't go down that path. Stop. Turn around. If you persist in that direction, you're going to die. Everybody in your vehicle is going to die. Why would I have such an urgency? Why would I have such passion? Because I know what's going to happen if you continue going as you're going. Then doesn't consistency demand of us some level of passion toward those that are on a path towards the destiny of the rich man of Luke 16? I don't want, you don't want, God is not willing that any should perish. We want everybody to be saved. And the reality is that some people are never going to be saved no matter what we say, no matter what we do. But the reality is also the case that some people may be saved if we will communicate to them that they can be saved. And they need to be saved. And here is how to be saved. And I'm not smart enough to know who will or who won't. Who will reject or who will accept. And maybe you're not either. And so we need to cast a wide net. 
We need to find creative and kind ways to communicate the saving gospel, the good news to everybody we care about. And, and, and you've got a long list of people that you care about. We've been using the phrase that Jesus used in, in the, that third parable of Luke 15 about this boy being in a far country. He's in a pig pen for a time. And, and maybe we're all blessed tonight that, that you and I, we're not in that pig pen. We're not in that far country. We're not in that famine land. We're not in that predicament. And let us thank God for that. Let us celebrate that, that we've, we've come out of that, that mud and that sin and we've, we've made a better path for our lives with God's help and the help of other people who love us. But probably in every family represented here tonight, we know of somebody who's in a far country. Probably all of us work around somebody who's still in a far country. We, we live near people who are in far country. We play ball with people. We go to classes with people who are in a far country. And I'm just trying to beg us, to plead with us, to not view these people just as we would view them as that's a, that's a redhead or that's a blonde head or that's a bald head. That's a lost person. That's a lost person. And everything I read about the scriptures tells me, tells us that lost is really terrible. And I don't want to, to lead my lost friend on. I don't want to mislead them into thinking because I don't say much about it. I don't have much energy towards getting them to not drive off that cliff. I don't want them to misinterpret my behavior or my lack of saying things to indicate that, that maybe lost is okay. God's a loving God and we'll put it all in His hands. Well, He is a loving God. He is a loving God. And a loving God has taught us in many different ways, in many different passages, to seek and save the lost. To find those in a far country, to go after those who are in pig pens, and try to bring them back. Well, I don't want to be judgmental. I don't want to be, I don't want to come across as goody two shoes. And I don't want to come across as being a fanatical. But the danger is then that we just don't come across at all. And we want to be light. And we want to get along. And we don't want people to think we're looking down on them. I get all that. I live with that same kind of stress and temptation myself. But I also don't want to see good people I know and I love lose their souls. And you don't either. You know, what's the sign of insanity? Well, they say, if we keep doing the same thing the same way, expect a different result, we're crazy. We're not going to save that lost fellow if we never talk to him. We're not going to lead them to Christ if we're not exalting Christ and letting our light shine. In Luke 15, we see it very powerfully taught. And in Luke 16, it's terrible to be lost. It's glorious to be found, to be saved. Let us be about the business of letting people know they can be saved. That we have been saved by the mercy of God and here's what we did. And if they'll do what we did, just as we did what those of the first century did, then they can be our brothers and sisters in Christ. We can come out of the far country and we can go together arm in arm, heart in heart, to the Father's house. To the Father's house. All right, think with me now, please, about why. Why Luke 15 is there. Why does Jesus tell about a lost coin, a lost sheep, a lost boy? And I want to suggest to you this. Think with me about it deeply. I want to suggest that the reason we're told about these three lost things is because Jesus knows in the telling of this, it can help us have a greater understanding of how it is that people today even in our community can get lost. You see, some people these days can become lost just like that sheep got lost. The sheep gets lost because he's careless. He doesn't intend to get lost. He just is grazing out in the pasture and doesn't pay attention to the direction he's going. And, and after a time, he looks up and he doesn't see any more sheep around him. And he doesn't see the shepherd and he's just drifted away. And now he's kind of clueless as to how to get back home. Well, people get lost that way. We don't, I, don't, I don't think probably any of us would be here tonight would, would get up on a particular day of our lives and say, well, today I'm going to choose to be lost. It doesn't work that way with us, does it? it just, it's kind of a, a gradual drift, and we're getting busy with life. And aren't we busy? 
Even you retired folks, you say you're busy and you've ever been in your life. Aren't we busy? We got, we got all kind of things. And a lot of these things are good things. They're important things. They're necessary, but, but they're just so, so time consuming and they can be so distracting. And we can kind of get our priorities out of whack. And, and, and we know from Scripture we're to seek first the kingdom of God. That's to be item one. Loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's to be item one. But we can get our priorities out of whack and we can kind of move away from the shepherd and we're not reading our Bible as much as we were. We're not putting in a good word for Jesus everywhere, every day, around everybody like we once did. We're not praying to God like we once did. We don't quite have the enthusiasm for worship that we once did. And, and you get the idea and we're just drifting away. And then suddenly we find ourselves in a far country in a pig pen where there is a famine and we got issues. That's how some people get lost. It's not a deliberate act. It's just a, a slow and steady drift. Chinese proverb says a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And so we don't need to take that first step away from God. But then also some people get lost like that coin got lost. The coin did not get lost through its own carelessness, but through the carelessness of the woman. She had ten of them and she just you know, wasn't as attentive to one of them and, and it got lost. Thankfully she found it later, but, but it got lost for a time. And, and people... Maybe not necessarily get lost because of our inattentiveness or our carelessness, but maybe our carelessness can be a contributing factor to their lostness. You know, somebody can kind of be slipping away and we're so busy with our stuff that we just don't notice. Or maybe sometimes we can inadvertently say something that comes across as insensitive or, or hurtful. Maybe we didn't mean it that way, but that's the way it was received. And, 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 and many different factors about us can contribute to someone else not wanting to be with God's people anymore. And, and, and sometimes our what lukewarmness, our cooling faithfulness can, can, can discourage other people and rub off on other people instead of drawing people to Christ it actually repels people away. And people could, could see in us words and behaviors and attitudes that are, that are not of God. And they might reasonably think, well, if that's what Christ is all about, that's what Christianity is all about, I want no part of that. And, and you understand that we probably have certain people in our circles of love and influence that are looking for a reason to drift away and never come back. And we can't be that reason. We can't be that excuse for them. Some people get lost through their own carelessness like a sheep. Some people get lost, at least a contributing factor, from our carelessness. Let's be attentive. People are fragile. You remember that, right? But then, thirdly, some people get lost these days like that boy got lost. It was just a deliberate act of rebellion. I'm tired of the rules. I'm tired of the curfews. I'm tired of... Being the little brother of this family, I'm going to run. I'm going to be free. I'm going to go have a ball. And he does for maybe five minutes. You know, sin usually starts out fun. That's why we commit sin, because it, it meets some kind of need that we think we have. But eventually, it really gets us in trouble. Remember, remember Samson and how, how his pursuit of sin got him into such big trouble? It, what, what did it do with him it, that we learned about sin it, it, it blinds, it, it, it binds, and it grinds. Remember? He lost his eyesight. He was all bound up. And then he's having to grind that, that meal like an animal would. Now sin does that. Sin does that. It's kind of crazy. Because sin is such an ultimately rotten thing for us, and yet so many are so determined to run to it. You know, when, we, when we're running... We're, we're more prone to fall, aren't we? I always wanted cowboy boots when I was a little boy. I wanted the, the kind that, uh, that the western stars wore, that uh, the heroes of my childhood movies wore, Gene Autry and that crew. I, mean, I thought they looked so good in those cowboy boots. My mama said... Jeff, you don't want to wear cowboy boots to school. That won't look good. Mama, give me some cowboy boots. I'm an only child, so you know how this story goes. I got the cowboy boots, and they were so beautiful. 
they were black, man. They were they were black, but they also had these these shiny speckly things on them. And and I wore them to school. I wore them to W. S. Neal, first grade. The other kids were jealous. I could tell of, of my boots, and and I thought I thought with my boots there came special powers. I really believe this. I thought it, that would make me run faster than anybody else in my car. I used to be competitive. I'm not competitive anymore. Um, Judy, don't laugh. That's a little obvious, please. And so I told those boys, I said, I'm going to race all of you. I got my, my cowboy boots, and I'll race every one of you. And so they, they had their, their, their tennis shoes on, and so they're ready to run. We all line up. All the girls are watching, waiting to be impressed. And teacher says, go. And we take off running. I'm running as fast as I can run in my brand new black cowboy boots. And I'm obviously going to win this race. And something happens where somebody is so resentful of me and my boots and my speed that they, that they trip me. They trip me. And it, it hurt me badly. I fell down, face plant. I'm embarrassed. And I talked about anger this morning. I got up angry. I got up off the ground anger. I'm ready to fight. I want to know who tripped me. And I, I demand, I'm asking all these guys racing with me, did you trip me? No. Did you trip me? No. I finally went to the teacher. I mean, I got tears coming down. I'm ready to, I'm ready to tear somebody up or try. And I asked the teacher, I said, did you see who tripped me? Now, I'm going to paraphrase what my teacher said. See, she said, you silly, silly boy. Nobody tripped you. You tripped over your own boots. And I couldn't believe that. I said, that's impossible. I, there, there's no way I tripped up. Yeah, you, you, you tripped yourself up. You tripped yourself up. And now that's been a few days ago, folks, that that happened. Why do I still remember that? Because I think that's a parable of, of my life and yours. And the parable of that, that runaway boy. And many people who run away these days. We... Some of us are lost because we choose to run away and, and it's our choice and we trip and we fall and it's something we have done to ourselves, right? Nobody can make us do a bad thing that we don't want to do. You know, think again about why are you here? You're here because you've chosen to be here. You've chosen to be here in spite of certain obstacles keeping you maybe away from being here with the Father's house and the Father's family, right? And, and you didn't come in here looking for a reason to leave. And, and you, you've never allowed the devil or the devil's agents to trip you up. And you've never tripped yourself up. But let us understand that ultimately each of us bears responsibility for ourselves. And it's our own cowboy boots, right? It's our own choices that we make. If we're going to run the Christian, see, there's a type of running. By the way, there's a hundred references to running in your Bible. Do you know that? Some of the running's good. Mark 9, there's a rich young ruler. He's running to Jesus. He walks away kind of sad because the cost was too high to follow Christ. Apostle Paul talks about the end of, of his life, 2 Timothy 4, beginning in verse 6, how he's run the race. That's a good kind of running. But there's a bad kind of running. And this, this boy in Luke 15 does it. There's a there's a, a type of running in, in Isaiah described as a running to evil. That's a, that's a rotten kind of running as well. Remember Jonah. We call him the running prophet, right? Chapter 1, he's running from God. Chapter 2, he's running to God. Chapter 3, he's running with God. Chapter 4, he's running ahead of God. But I want to direct your attention to him running from God. Remember, his job is to go to Nineveh. And save the lost people. Because lost is bad. It's bad then, it's still bad. But he decides to get on a ship and, and run away and go to a place called Tarshish. And, and we all have a potential Tarshish. A place where the devil wants us to go that God does not want us to go. Thankfully, this runaway prophet was intercepted by a gigantic fish or whale, depending on your translation. It's not worth fussing about. But I'm thankful that God put a well in his path. And, and we should all pray for a similar fish in our path, right? If we're running away from God, if we're running, running away from his family, if we're running away from our responsibility, that's our choice. Because we chose to put those running shoes on and go to a far country.
It is an interesting chapter in teaching us how it is that some people get lost. Talked to one fellow, dying of cancer, quit the church, quit God, not this congregation. I would never tell a story that would, where you would sit there, hey, I know who he's talking about. I wouldn't do that, especially one that put somebody in a bad light. Why did you quit? I asked. And he told me. I shared this with a Bible class one time here. He quit because, as some of you have been waiting in lines even today to, to visit with a, a family that's hurting over the loss of a loved one. He said, Jeff, I've been waiting, and maybe this is a slight exaggeration, I've been waiting two or three hours in line. Preacher walks in. I'm near the, near the casket now, near the family. Preacher walks in. Thankfully, not this preacher. Preacher walks in with an elder and their wives. Preacher says, audibly enough to be heard by this fellow and others, I, I've got a busy day tomorrow and I need to break in line. And He quit church over that. And I pointed out to him what you're sitting there thinking, probably more, you're thinking it more eloquently than I put it, but you can't let the behavior of others affect your relationship with God. God didn't cut in line. God didn't do it. But, but what's going on there? That's somebody who's looking for a reason. And the devil, and a, and a, excuse my, everybody listens when I say, excuse my frankness, a dumb preacher. That's a dumb preacher thing to do. And I'm familiar with dumb preacher. I'm kind of an expert in that. But don't let a dumb preacher or a dumb anybody cause you to, you know, we talk about hip, hypocrisy. So I, went to, I went to church as a younger guy in Bruton with a, a sweet young girl, so much potential. And, and yet she just could not stay faithful to God. And I asked her one time, what's going on with you? And, and she said, it's the hypocrites. I just don't want to be a part of the hypocrisy. And I tried to point out to her, sweet girl, if you let a hypocrite get between you and God, guess who's closer to God than you are? But again, ultimately, at the end of the day, it was her decision to, to step away. I know of another um, person who, just such a trivial thing. Again, it got back to their choice, their decision. You see the clock? I know. Did y'all realize we got a clock over? I bet nobody but me knows we got a clock over here. You know that? We got a clock there, and now, thankfully, they've returned the clock to the back back there where I can see how long these sermons are lasting. One fella quit. Because he went to a congregation that did not start on time, whatever that means, and did not end on time. He quit. And again, I would suggest that's a fellow looking to quit, and the devil supplied him the excuse, or we were facilitators in that. But he tripped over his own cowboy boots. Nobody makes us do any good thing. Nobody makes us do any bad thing. Nobody made that, that young boy run away, uh, and nobody made him come home. That was his choice to go. Thankfully, it was his choice to come back. Good news is, same road took him away. Same road that, that brought, him, brought him home. One of the things I've noticed in my family, my extended family, is that, that, that contributed to many of them going into a far country and land of famine and leaving God, leaving God's people, is because of, uh, this is just a contributing factor, not the primary call, but a contributing factor is uh, the people they chose to marry the people they chose to marry. Many of these relatives of mine were not real strong Christians to begin with in, in some areas of their life, and so they really needed to marry people that would draw them closer to God, that would, that would pick them up and strengthen them. And, and not only did they not marry other Christians, but they married people who would influence them further away from God. And that's, that's the, one of the great tragedies and, and shames of, of many of those that are related to me that I deeply care about. They married outside of Christ, and they ultimately left Christ. Did you know that they have done some research on this, and, and, and the, the numbers are very depressing, very concerning, that approximately 80% of those who marry outside of Christ ultimately leave Christ. And if I said 80% of the folks that cross this highway tonight are going get, to get run over, I don't think any of us be lining up to cross that highway and yet we just line up to marry those who are not going to strengthen us or that we can strengthen and lead to Christ. It's just something we've got to think about. 
about not being unequally yoked with someone who can, can get us in trouble. Now, my parents were a, a grand and glorious exception to this. My, my father was not on a good path when he met and ultimately married my mom. And she, she introduced him to our Lord's gospel, and he was saved, and he became a great deacon in the church. He had some issues, as you'll recall, with alcohol and some sins connected with that. But his last Sunday on earth, he came forward, last Sunday on earth before going into the hospital for the last time, he comes forward again and asks the church to pray for him, to forgive him, to help him be the kind of daddy to Jeff, the kind of husband to Eunice that he wanted to be. But uh, if he doesn't marry my mom, I doubt he has that opportunity to receive salvation. So I know, and there are many exceptions in these pews tonight. Many of you are Christians today because you married well. You outkicked your coverage spiritually, right? And, and you're saved tonight, and we thank God for the choice you made. But, but many, many people who marry outside of Christ do not come to Christ as you have. And so you're to be commended. But let's emphasize to our children and to our grandchildren, it does matter who you date. It does matter who you marry. And let's date good people. Let's marry those who will draw us closer to God. Now, one other thing I want to say before we, we close all this up. I'm thinking about Luke 15 and why it's there and and, and the possible 2013 applications. And, and, and I, I want to, before I forget this, it's important. I want you to continue to pray for Jennifer Hall, Hunter Thompson, Matt Wright, Wesley Campbell, Heather James, Dylan Brown, and Vicki Brown. These are good people, good members of our family here who have recently come and asked for prayers, and I'm thankful for them. And they've asked for forgiveness if they've sinned against us. And they've asked us to help them, to supply them with strength for the journey. And that's an honor. And we need to have those good people at the top of our prayer list and others who maybe need to do the same. All right. Here's one of the extra bad parts of going into a far country. Sometimes when we go into a far country, we don't go by ourselves. The, the younger brother, he went alone. If there is a a silver line to the story, that's it. He didn't take his father with him. He didn't take his older brother with him. He went there by himself. He hurt them, but he went there by himself. If we were going to do a modern day 2013 retelling of the parable of the prodigal son, which I've mentioned to you many times ought to be called the parable of the loving father, but if we were going to retell that these days based on what we frequently see, it would go something like this. It would not be the parable of the prodigal son. In many cases, it'd be the parable of the prodigal parents. It'd be the parable of the prodigal parents. Because these days, far too many parents who have been raised up by their own parents in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, too many parents who've been raised up going to the church that Jesus built, going to a place where they had access to the saving gospel of Jesus, too many parents who were brought up in that kind of home are not bringing their own children up in that kind of home. And, and those parents are making the decision that the kingdom of God does not come first. It might not even be second, third, or fourth. It's on the list somewhere, but, but, but not, not up at the top. And so we got too many parents. I'm editorializing we, not necessarily we that are in this room, but we that are in this community, we that are in this world. Too many parents are going into a far country. And, and you know how this works. When mom and dad go to a far country, oftentimes the children accompany them on that path. And that's just reasonable. That's just logical. Those of you that have children at home, you think about, where did your children go to church this morning? Well, if you came here, they came here. Where did they eat lunch today? Well, they ate lunch wherever you ate lunch. Where will they go tonight? They're going to go wherever you go. And, and so you understand that that'd be the same case with most of us spiritually, if, if I'm a daddy and I'm going to go to a far country, well, it's in all probability, my, my kids are going to tag along with me. They love me. They respect me. Daddy's usually right, and so we're going to go like daddy goes. Daddy would never make a decision to hurt me, to hurt us, to hurt our family. And, and it is so, it's so indefensible, really, that so many parents were given a gift of access to the gospel of Christ by our parents. And we do not give our same, our own kids, that opportunity that we receive. We're blessed. I was blessed. My parents weren't perfect, but, but Tommy and Eunice Abrams, they love me. 
They made sure I worshipped. They made sure I was at work days. They made sure that I was hanging out as best they could control it with good people. Now, if I'm, a, if I'm grateful for that gift, if I'm grateful for that, that treasure that they, they gave me access to, aren't I obligated to do the same for my children? I mean, aren't I obligated to try to bring them up in the nurture and admonition? So Ephesians 6, 4 is directly to you fathers and to this father. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If a daddy is in a far country, is he, if he's left God, then he cannot possibly bring his children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord from that location. It just can't happen. So we as dads, we as moms, we got to make sure that we are right with God so that we can help our children to be right with God. Don't they deserve that? Don't they deserve access to what we were given access to? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for...